Hello, in this video I'm going to talk about twin loop knots. Um, this video was kind of prompted by uh, some specific questions relating to the use of these twin loop knots, um, one of which was being like, which is the best one to use? Um, now, spoiler alert, I'm not going to answer that. We are just going to look at some of the generic safety points and the principles for use for any twin loop knot, uh, like where we can park our cow's tails, where we can attach our belay point into. Um, the other question I was asked was, well, what happens if one of the loops fails uh, on one of these twin loop knots? So we'll have a look at redundancy versus equalisation as well. Um, Okay, I won't talk about this kind of specific choice between which knot for which scenario and which knot for another scenario. I think that's far better done uh, in practical training because um, sometimes there are uh, potentially better options in some circumstances but a video like this isn't really the place to go into that level of detail. Um, so we'll start with why do we use twin loop knots? Well, they're, they're neat, they're nice, they're compact. Uh, it's a single knot which makes it fairly easy to equalise a pair of anchors um, so you can have your arms really long, really short, different lengths um, so you can bring together pairs of anchors in all sorts of different permutations. Um, they give you a nice master point to attach uh, your gear to. Um, if you were using just butterflies to build your wire hang you might have to put a master knot underneath there and that drops the height of your rigging. So in an area where you know if you go too low it's going to make things really difficult for you to operate. Having a twin loop knot with your belay point nice and high can make things you know really much more user friendly for the operator. Um, and the other thing is the traverse line tends to come straight into the centre of the knot, um, which means getting on and off the pitch with cow's tails, be it you in an SRT gear or your clients coming up the ladder and needing to put their cow's tails on, it just makes that process a little bit easier as well. Um, there are certainly situations where I wouldn't use a twin loop knot, but again, that's a subject really for practical training as opposed to a, a video like this. Um, so let's start by just having a look at some of the different options for twin loop knots that are currently out there. Okay. First up, we've got the bowling on the bike, which is a pretty standard twin loop knot, fairly universal amongst uh, cavers, um, becoming a bit more common with climbers as well these days. Um, far more common in climbing rope access circles though uh, is the figure of eight bunny ears knot. Um, absolutely nothing wrong with using that underground at all, perfectly reasonable knot. And then we have two slightly less common variants of the twin loop knot. So we have the carash knot, which is also known as the fusion knot. Um, it's like a bowling on the bike with a figure of eight on the bike base. And we have the double bowling on the bike, which again is like a bowling on the bike, but with a capuchin knot base as opposed to an overhand knot. Now, with our twin loop knots, uh, when we're attaching gear to them, we must clip things through both of the loops. And that doesn't mean one thing through each loop, it means that any individual attachment must connect to both loops. Okay, you've got to be wary not to clip two strands but end up just around one loop. Um, now the reason for that is simple. When you load a single loop on one of these in a particular point, in a particular orientation, you can get the knot to run and start to loosen off. Um, there's a video of that for you, you can watch in a second. So whenever you deal with a twin loop knot, be it a bone on the bike or any of the other variants, treat your attachment point the same always clip in to both of the loops every time. Okay, drop test onto a bone on the bike, correctly dressed but not tightened on a wet road. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> so that particular um, method of failure you've just seen in the video there is to do with the bowling on the bike, only having kind of one turn around it as the rope passes through. Um, with a figure of eight on a bike, carash knot, fusion knot, um, or the double figure of eight on the bike, that particular failure mechanism doesn't appear to be a problem. Um, what is common with all of the twin loop knots is that both loops do share a common strand. So if you were to use something that wasn't a bowling on the bike, where that slippage is less of a concern and only clipped into one loop. Well, you can still distort the knot. If you fell heavily onto one side of the Y hang, it can kind of pull that over and destabilize it and pull one loop into the other. So, regardless of whether you're using a bowling on the bike or not, you know, the safest thing to do and to teach is to be clipping into 
both loops on that knot, whichever one it is. So um, if you're mounting your VLA device or your hauling gear into both loops, and if you're teaching people SRT progression, again, making sure that they need, they know that they need to clip into both loops every time. So with the bowline on the bike, we can park two different sets of gear in there. We can put our cow's tails front or back and our belay gear on the other side there. Um, same thing with the figure of eight bunny ears. Uh, we get two different parking points, one on either side of the knot. A little bit less obvious to spot with those figure eights. The bowling family are nice because the loops originate from a different part of the knot. So it holds those loops open, makes it a little bit clearer where you're clipping to. Um, so again, with the Fusion or Karash and the double bowling on the bike, you get that nice two options there uh, of your different points that you can park your gear into. So we know now that we need to clip uh, into both loops of any twin loop knot. Um, for the bowling on the bike, that's primarily to eliminate the risk of that running slip where the pitch rope can pull up and turn through the knot. Um, but for all of them, there's a chance if you overload one loop, uh, it can distort the whole knot, shorten one loop, pull it into the other, um, and then you end up with a bigger problem with your equalisation at the top. Um, now, when we think of these twin loop knots, it's important to remember that they're not independent loops. They're two loops formed by one knot. Um, so if you were to cut, sever, break one loop, that doesn't mean that the other one is bomb-proof and isn't going to go anywhere. They are linked by one common strand of rope. So here's your figure of eight bunny ears. Um, you've got the two loops and then one strand of rope there forms both of the loops. So they're not independent. We use a twin loop knot for equalisation of two anchor points. Um, if we need true independence then we need to use two different knots, two different systems. Um, so whenever someone is saying, you know, is asking me well which of these knots is the strongest or which one's the best one if I'm likely to have uh, a loop damaged or cut, well, the answer is none of them. Um, they're for equalisation, not for independence. Yeah. Um, let's say if you need true independence, use two different knots. So the failure of either half of that system would still, uh, that you know, wouldn't impact on the other one. Yeah. So the aim here is just to show you where the common loops uh, are for each knot. So here we have the bowling on the bike. See there, the nipping turn. Moving on to the figure eight on the bike, one that's often described as kind of independent loops. Well, you can see there it's exactly the same section of rope that forms both the loops okay and all the bowling family are the same really you've just got that single nipping uh, section of loop that goes around the two working parts there we go so no independence across any of those knots so we can see that our two loops on these twin loop knots uh, aren't redundant they just allow us to equalize two anchors um, so it doesn't make these knots pointless we we want to equalize our anchors. We want to share the load as much as possible because um, in doing so we're limiting the load on any one particular anchor. Um, and one of the other things that these knots do because they share that common strand through both loops is to a greater or lesser extent should one of the anchor points fail that the twin loop knot is attached to. So that's not the loop failing itself, one of the anchor points so the knot is still intact. Um, as the load comes onto the rem the remaining anchor point, onto the single loop, um, what you find is that the loop that's on the failed anchor will pull into the knot and the one that's still attached to the anchor may extend. Um, in that way there's a bit of a slip and a readjustment in the knot. Um, now movement and, and changes in your knots once you've tied them are, are, are rarely a positive thing. Um, but let's say one of your anchors does blow on a Y-hang, um, then the slippage of the centre point of that knot as it shifts towards the remaining arm, um, which extends a little bit, well that's acting like a mini shock absorber as well. Um, so it's hard to predict how much it's going to do, so it's one of the features of the knot that we, we know it does so, but we can't really say with much certainty how much it's going to do so. Um, do so. Um, but it does give us a little bit of a shock absorber in the system. Um, there's another reason why you might use something like a bowling on the bite on a rebelay or a single bolt rebelay. So if that goes, you know that that knot's going to slip and take some of the force um, out of that system. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we use our twin loop knots for equalisation of two anchors. 
um, they give us a nice high point with which we can mount our cow's tails or put our belay or rescue gear into when we don't have the headroom for a multi-knot system with a master point knot um, and they just make things nice and neat um, but definitely not the only way of rigging a pitch, just one option. Um, so hopefully you know a little bit more about twin loop knots now and some of the things to watch out for uh, and how we need to think about their use and where we attach into them. And just to reinforce one more time, don't forget, every time you clip something into a twin loop knot, you need to make sure it is clipped through both of the loops. Thanks for watching.